Thank you, Lord, that you called us out of darkness into marvelous light. And I pray today that you would help us, Lord, to dive into your word, Lord God, to, to understand, Lord God, to rightly divide the word of truth, Lord Jesus. A work man not need to be ashamed, Lord God. But I pray here today, Lord God, that our, your word would be hidden in our hearts, Lord, that we should not sin against you. Rather, oh God, we want to please you in everything that we do. We pray that your will would be done over this place, Lord, and we give you the glory, we give you the honor, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 Okay, talked about the parable of the sower um, and the seed. That's the one that Jesus started off with in the book of Matthew. And it brought the question on, from the disciples, Lord, why are you teaching in parables? Does anybody remember why? Why? We talked about this last time. Why did the Lord teach in parables? I heard five answers. Go ahead. <laughs> what meant for the heathen to understand? I don't think that's the exact words he used. Uh, Ellie had an answer. Go ahead. I'll come to you, Brother Bo. Because it was something they could understand and relate to. Uh, that is true, but that is not necessarily the reason why he gave that he spoke to them in parables. No, it wasn't the children's bread at all. Go ahead, Brother Bo. Yeah. Correct. Correct. They. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was saying that that that's a quote from the scripture in Isaiah. Essentially, Jesus knew their motive. And he knew they weren't really there to be true followers of him. They were really only there for other reasons. It was the crowd, the miracles, the fish and the bread that they would that they would get from Jesus. And and furthermore. Um, his disciples would be the one to sacrifice to follow him. They followed Jesus wherever he went. And so he told his disciples, it's giving to you to know the kingdom. And so um, I encourage people, don't be content with remaining in the multitude, okay. um, which is quite, quite the spectacle because if you can understand it, imagine if you came to church and all that you heard was, a sower sowed seed, and some seed fell by the wayside, you know, and the, and the fowls caught it up, and then another seed fell up on thorny, rocky ground, and it had no root in them. So when the sun came and scorched it, and it withered away, and then another seed fell up on thorns, and the thorns choked it out that it didn't bear fruit, but some seed fell up on good ground and produced 160 and 30-fold. Imagine if that was my sermon for Sunday morning, and I said, God bless you. You're dismissed in the fear of the Lord. <laughs> huh? You're farming. <laughs> it's like, what is wrong with this pastor? Why did he just talk to me about agriculture? <laughs> Thousands of mul multitudes of people Jesus is talking to. And his disciples are sitting back there scratching their head like, Lord, why are you talking to him like that? He said, because it's not for them to know. Ooh. Amen. So we, we dealt with that last time. Then we broke down what was the parable of the sower. And uh, I think we did, did a pretty good job with that. Um, we also went to the parable of the talents. Today, we're going to cover uh, another parable in Matthew 13. There are many parables in Matthew 13, by the way. Let me count them right here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight parables in Matthew 13. We're not going to read all of those. I'm just going to hit maybe two or three more. Um, the last two that I talk about, it's pretty self-explanatory. So we won't have to spend the whole Bible study. And then we'll go to Matthew 22 and then back to Matthew 25. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? Are you? Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> let's go now, Matthew chapter number 13. And let's go to verse 24. Matthew 13, verse 24. Parable of the tares. Another, tares. another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. 
So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. Mm. The servant said unto him, Would thou then what that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gathered up the tares, yet root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest, and, the, and, the, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, bind, the bundle, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather, wheat, gather the wheat into the, my barn. Okay, so here's again, Jesus is speaking this parable to the multitude. Now, he doesn't explain every parable that he talks about in this chapter, uh, but he does explain a few of them. And this is one that he gives an explanation to, along with the parable of the sower and the seed. But here we go again. We've got another agricultural parable. And this time, um, we have, uh, the Lord says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man which sowed what? Verse 24. Good seed. into uh, Brother Bill, you do a favor, turn that TV on right there. It's, I'm looking at it. Sorry. Um, good seed in this field. So we have the Lord how now the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed into his field. But while his men slept, his enemy came and did what? Sowed tares among the wheat. You're good. Good seed. And went his way. And they started to spring up. And the servants of the householder came and said, we know you put good seed in the field how did these tares get there? And, 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 and the, the master of the field knew what happened. He said, an enemy has done this. And so the suggestion of his servants is to do what? Go pull up the weeds. Go, go, you want us to go out there and weed? Anybody ever weeded a garden before or weeded around your house? It's backbreaking work. Oh my gosh, I used to have to do it because you can't just and you can't just snatching everything because you're going snatching up the good stuff. So you gotta, you know. Sometimes I try to get down on my knees, and my mom's like, "You can't work on your knees." I'm like, "Oh, I gotta bend my back." But you gotta be meticulous because you don't want to pull up the 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 good stuff because if you pull up the good stuff, uh, you'll be gone and tears. And wheat look very close to one another until they produce fruit. You don't really know the difference. If you look at a whole field, they all, it all look the same. Well, yeah. So it all looks the same. Go, go, go Google a picture of a tares and wheat, and they look the same until the harvest comes. There will be wheat on one and no fruit grain on the other. The other one's just a wheat. You know, how many have weeds? You don't have to really plant those, do you? They just kind of... They just kind of show up. Thorns and thistles. Praise God. Okay. And the Lord's response is, no, I don't want you to root it up because uh, I want you to let both grow together until what? Harvest. Then, at that time, you're going to gather the tares first. Bind them in bundles to burn, but then gather the wheat into his barn. Now, let's look at the explanation of this. Par and this is a powerful parable that we've got to pay attention to the, uh, today. Uh, let's go down to verse 36, and let's, let's hear the explanation that Jesus gives for this particular parable. Matthew 13, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and a disciple came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto, him, unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Mm. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, mm -hmm. but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Mm. The enemy that sowed them is, them is the devil. Yes. The mm. harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Ooh. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The son of man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his, out of his kingdom mm. all things that offend and them that which do iniquity uh -huh. and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Yes. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Mm -hmm. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of, kingdom of their father. 
who ears have to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. Let him hear. Praise God. So Jesus begins to give explanation to the various elements in this parable. He said, the sower is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are who? Children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is who? Devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. Now, in this particular one, he doesn't repeat the parable. It's up to us to kind of go back to what he said and, and kind of substitute the elements for what we know that they really are. So now let's go back to the parable. Go way back up. And you don't have to read it again. I'll kind of do it. Okay. The kingdom of heaven, verse 24, is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. That's Jesus. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. The enemy is the devil. There is a devil. There is spiritual warfare going on all over throughout the world. And its focus is on the harvest field, which Jesus says is the world. Okay? And he sowed uh, these tares right alongside the wheat. And look at this. He went his way. What, what's that? What verse is that? There you go. He went. So the devil just sows a seed and goes his way. Doesn't need to stick around because the seed is only going to reproduce after its kind. And it looks the same as all the rest. <clears throat> Are you getting the picture here? It looks the same. It's so much so that when the servants, who are the angels, requesting of God, do you want us to go do something about these tares that have grown up? The master, Jesus, says, no. Let everybody grow up together until harvest. Why? Why? Because it'll be very easy to tell which ones are the children of the king righteous and the children of the wicked one. You'll know it by their fruit. Hello, somebody. You might look the same. Here we go. It might say church on the building. It might be a huge ministry. Because there's a lot of weeds out there. And weeds grow the actual thing you're trying to plant. That's how this thing, that's why Jesus is using this example. Weeds grow very quick. They'll shoot up real quick. However, if you want to get a harvest from something, there's going to be seasons that it takes. You got to grow this thing in the right season. Hello? And all these are examples. And so what the Lord is saying is that there's going to be the wicked one that sows all kinds of tares amongst what is the true and real thing. This is why people get frustrated with church. Christianity is one of the most divided religions in the world. We got this denomination and that denomination and this and these people got it and this got it and this got it and this got it. We're 2,000 years removed from the death of Jesus Christ and, and the enemy has already sowed that seed. He's not even sticking around anymore. These are just the product of tears. Whew. Glory to God. And the, the most devastating fact is that you, they're not really, we're not really going to know. Until the end of the world has come. That's why I said we got to pay attention to this. Because this applies directly to us. We got to make sure we're not tares. How? How do you know? It's by what you were born of. What seed? Is this something that God started? Or is this something that man started? This is why in this church we stick true to the word of God. Not tradition. Not rudiments of this world. Not philosophy. Nor vain deceit. Nor words of men, church fathers, orthodoxy. None of that. Right here in the word of God. Jesus established it. We dealt with the new birth, which, which again, of course, you're going to be born by what seeds. So Jesus said you must be born again of the water and of the spirit. If you, if you get it another way, what seed are you from? You got to be. And notice there aren't a middle ground. It's not like there's wheat and there's tares and there's tulips. <laughs> a lot of people think, well, I'm just in that middle ground. No, there is no middle ground. You're either the seed of this one or you're the seed of the other one. Mm. 
Hello, somebody. And the devil's not even sticking around. He just sowed it. He didn't have to stick around. It's already planted. He can leave. The foundation is incorrect. The seed that was sown is incorrect. You, Jesus said a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit, and a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. He said you shall know them by their fruit. I like to teach this parable because it, it, gives, it gives some credence to why a lot of questions that people have. Well, why are there so many denominations? Tears. Why are there so many differences of opinion when the word of God is very clear? Tears. It didn't, we, didn't, we don't even get out of the New Testament before John writes in one of his epistles that the spirit of Antichrist doth already work. He was dealing with false doctrine then. Paul was dealing with false doctrine then. All throughout Corinthians and Galatians and a couple of other books, he was already dealing. In Jude and in Titus, there are men, this Bible says, that crept in unawares that were teaching false doctrine to the churches that were no more than 20 years old, 20 years removed from the death of Jesus Christ. And those tears had already crept in. That's why he said, I need to write to you that you earnestly contend for the faith because there's an enemy that's trying to pervert the true thing. The, the wicked one, this devil is not just satisfied with having his own. He wants to defile that which is holy. He wants to pervert that which is true. He wants to water down the truth with the half of a lie. Amen. Praise God. And this, this explanation comes by by request of the disciples and Jesus gives us this and he said to them um, let's go back down to the uh, uh, to the to the explanation here Jesus said uh, verse 40 as therefore the tares are gathered excuse me verse 39 the enemy that sold them is the devil the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire so shall it be in the end of the world the son of the man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. What does that word of offend mean? Go against God. Specifically go against his word. And it's a legal term. You have an offense against you. You violated the law. <laughs> Praise God. What does iniquity mean? Self-will. You did what you wanted. Or the, the, the more proper definition is lawlessness. You're a law unto yourself. Verse 42, shall cast them in the, in the, in, into a, ferning, excuse me, a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's a representation of the lake of fire. Uh, and any time Jesus mentioned that, there's this weeping or wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's when you grind your teeth. It hurts so much. You're in so much pain that you grind your teeth. Mm. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Um, that's talking about the new heaven and new earth. Amen. All right. <clears throat> any questions regarding the parable of the tares? We didn't tares. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's an, an example of it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. And they don't know. They don't know. Remember, in the, in the example Jesus gave, the devil just sold the seed and left. Once the seed rises up, it's not like he's not like you're gonna know, oh, this is this is not true, this is false. There's only one way to know that. The word of God. Is the foundation right? Is it the right seed? If not, I don't care if it looks like, acts like, sounds like, smells like, it is not. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it is, doesn't, doesn't say that it disrupt necessarily the growth. It can. The weeds can do that, absolutely. But um, yeah, that, that's more the example from the parable of the of sower. Uh, that grew up among thorns. But in, in that 
instance, the, the growth hindrance was from the things that were surrounding our lives. The Lord said the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Um, in this instance, there's no indication that the, the tears disrupted the growth so much um, as it was an obfuscation of the truth, of the real thing, um, which leads to the next parable, actually, which is the, uh, the treasure in the field. Verse number 44. This should challenge everyone's perception of Christianity right here. This one does. All right, verse 44, real quick. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, that which when a man had found, he hid it. And for joy thereof, goeth and selleth all that he had, and buyeth that field. Mm -hmm. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one, pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. Okay. What does this tell us about the kingdom of God? These two parables, they're very similar. What would you say? Give everything else up. In, yeah, in, in both one, they sold everything. Yes, to buy the pearl and to buy the field. In the first one, the treasure is where? In the field, but it's, it's not just like sitting there. It's hidden. You don't get it? So it's, it's hidden. Mainly, mainly me, you're not just going to stumble across this. You, you ever see them guys walking the beach with the headphones on and the metal detectors? Some of the guys, they find a lot of treasure. You know, you know. So, you know, you, you average, average person out there building sandcastles and, you know, flying kites and you know, playing water polo or whatever is not going to find, you know, a, a, a golden coin hidden in the sand. You're not looking for it. You're in the same location, but you're not looking for it. Yes. God is only going to give this to those who are looking for it. That's intentional. You've got to want it. You're right. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. It starts with action upon our part. I've wanted. it. Yes, sir. Yeah. You're not just going to find it by accident. You're not just going to have, that's why I don't believe none of you are here today or come to any of our Bible studies in our church by accident. No such thing. No such thing. Now, he's searching for it, and he found it. And he knew. Uh, let's, let's read it again. Again, the kingdom of heaven, verse 44, is hid in the field. It's like a treasure hid in the field that when a man hath found it, he hideth and for joy thereof go and sell all that he hath and buy what? The whole field. I want it all. That's how much it's going to cost you. And the pearl backs up that, that statement. Because now instead of a field, it's like the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking pearls. When he had found one pearl of a small price... Is this thing going to be cheap for us? Is it going to be easy for us? No, it's a great price. And in order for you to obtain this, you're going to have to sell. That's, that's tough. That's tough. What does that mean? Can I buy salvation? Well, no, you can't buy your salvation. Absolutely not. Uh, it, it is a gift of God, given by the grace of God. This grace for, afforded us an opportunity to even be able to find it in the first place. But once we have found the truth, we have an option. And, and the metaphor is given of selling. That's sacrifice. I'm sacrificing my life. I'm laying down my will. Paul said, I beseech you, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, he said, 
which is holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is a reasonable service. And he said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There was never supposed to be a thing, such a thing as an easy Christianity. It doesn't exist. We were meant to sell out all for God. We weren't meant to be casual churchgoers, only worshiping one day a week. We weren't, amen. <laughs> it, it's, that's, that's, that's not the example that we're, as a matter of fact, Jesus said later on very plainly to his disciples, if any man will follow me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow after me. For if a man will save his life, the Lord said, you're going to lose it. He said, but if you will lose your life for my name's sake, he said, there will you find it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In another instance, a young rich ruler shows up to Jesus. You probably heard this story before. It's not a parable. This actually happened. Shows up to Jesus and he said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord just says, well, keep, keep the Ten Commandments. So, you know, uh, thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not commit adultery. Bring no false witness. Don't covet all of that. And, and he said, all that I've done since my youth, what lack I yet? Here's what the Lord said. Go and sell all that you own. Give it to the poor that you may have riches in heaven and come and follow me. This man had an invitation to be the 13th disciple and missed it because he had much riches. He had much goods. And he didn't tell Jesus he had much goods. Jesus just already knew. So the one thing that he lacked is that he put his money, which it, there's no implication that he, he got these riches by, by, by ill-gotten means, by, by negative means. And not like a corrupt guy. This might have been a legitimate businessman, an upright man that lived for God, but yet his money was his God. He kept all the commandments. But when it came to selling out, he was not able to do it. Now, does it mean we can't be rich? No. Just as God tells you to give it all up, give it all up and follow him. And then Jesus said, well, it's easier for a camel to come through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich, rich man to enter into heaven. Because the more you have, the harder it is to give it up. The more you have, the harder it is to give it up. And so um, I like these parables because it challenges our perspective now, you can follow God and be, a, and be a very blessed person. In the book of Acts, there were people that sold their possessions and gave them over to the church. And I, I think there should be very financially stable people in the church. As a matter of fact, I preach and teach that if you follow the biblical commandments concerning finances, you're going to be wealthy. You're going to be a good steward of your things. You're going to make wise investments and your things are going to grow. But that money cannot become your God. That money cannot become a hindrance. Uh, and which is Jesus, what, that's what Jesus said. It's, look, you can't serve two masters. You're either going to love the one or hate the other. In Matthew chapter 6, he said, you cannot serve God and mammon, which is riches. Because Jesus knew his number one competition is going to be money. It's not sex. It's not fame. It's not power. It's money. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And so in these examples, this person that was seeking this treasure and seeking these pearls understood the price of it and went and sold all that he had and bought it and maintained it. This is an example for us that, that Jesus wants it all. He said, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all of your strength. That's everything you are. Everything. God wants it all. It wants it all, and he's willing to give you all in return. See, and you can look at this and be like, man, that's, that's a huge sacrifice. No, it's a great investment. How many of y'all wish you could have invested in Apple in the 80s? Or could have best invested in Bitcoin when it was pennies for a coin? Right now, it's what, it's like a 60, 60K above? That would have been the greatest investment. Now, everybody else might have called you stupid at the time. What are you doing investing in this questionable, frivolous, non-real cryptocurrency? That's dumb. You spend it all. You put all, you put all your money into that, they, and they, they will be eating grass <laughs> right now because you would be a billionaire twice, I don't know, 
Okay, so then you got to reposition this thing. What would cause a man to sell all that he had to buy a whole field? Well, just practically, I'm looking for a greater return on investment. And the reality is, is that if we sell all out right now, that's why the Lord can say, what is it profit? That's, that's, that, that, that's money terms. <laughs> what is your, not, not revenue, <laughs> what is your profit? If you gain the whole world and lose your soul, that implies that if you maintain your soul, you're going to come out much more ahead on the end than, you would have, than if you would have gained the whole world. That means if you add up all the money, all the cars, all the houses, all the riches, all the mansions, all the property, all the islands, all the mountains, all the land, all the seas of this whole world. What Jesus is going to give you when he comes back, if you live for him, is going to be worth more than all of that combined. Hello. To me, that's a good investment. I'll serve the Lord for that. Well, all I have to do is present my body a living sacrifice. All I have to do is do what he wants me to do, and I get all of that? Sign me up. It's not a trouble when you look at it like that. Sometimes I think we've got to shift our perspective about these things to make the sacrifice worth it, because I know that there's greater coming. Amen. Somebody's hand was up, was it? Go ahead. Yeah, he turned it down. He had the same offer. It, his was a shortcut, though. He was, he was, that was inside training. <laughs> inside the training. Amen. Okay, let's, let, let's, let's get out of chapter 13 and let's go to chapter 22. We're going to talk about the parable of the banquet and then we'll do the 10 virgins and then we'll close out today. And Jesus answered and spake un, unto them again by parables. And said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings mm -hmm. are killed, yes. and, all, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. And went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Mm -hmm. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they which were hit bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Yes. So those servants without into the highways, and gathered them together as all they found, both bad and good. The wedding was furnished with guests. All right, so this is, this is the first part of this parable. This is a parable of, of the, the, the feast. Uh, you can read it also. I believe it's in Luke 14. It's a very similar parable. Uh, it goes into some details on to why these uh, attendees uh, disregarded the invitation. Um, I think it says one of them, one of them had land, the other one had oxen, five yoke of oxen, and the other one had a wife. So Luke gives us some more context as to what, what the reasons were that they denied it. But uh, it says the kingdom of heaven is like a king which made a marriage for his son. So um, now this one's not given an explanation. We just have to imply what these things mean. And I think we can do so pretty accurately based off the details of the other parable. So here we go. Marriage for a son. This is obviously talking about Jesus Christ because we are called the bride of Christ. So, and this is the, uh, this is the marriage supper of the lamb, which you can read about in the book of Revelation where his bride will come forth. And so there are people that are called to this event. And the Bible says uh, the servants were sent out to call them that were bidden, verse three, to the wedding, and they would not come. Okay, and he sent forth another servant saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my ox, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But verse 5 says, but they what? They made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. So they were too busy to be bothered with God. Now, in this, in the, in this example, this is not God, this is a man throwing a, 
throwing a, a, a wedding feast. Um, but the implication is that this is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is like unto. So, so there will be people called, invited to this. And there's an initial invitation list because when you have a wedding, do they still do lists for people that you can't invite everybody to your wedding because you got to feed everybody? And that costs a lot of money. And you probably don't want everybody at your wedding because some of the people probably don't like you. And so <laughs> send out invitations, right? And so how, how, how upset would you be if you had a list of people that you initially thought they're going to be so excited to receive my invitation in the mail? They're going to be so excited. They're going to, I'm going to be flooding with RSVPs immediately because these people love me. And only to find out nobody wants to come. And that, that's, that's, that, that's a consideration. I, he, the fatlings are prepared. I made a lot of preparation for this. I've spent a lot of money. I've hired a lot of decorations. I've built up a lot of, you know, if you're going to put on a banquet, this is going to cost some money. Parties cost. Events like this cost. Fatlings are killed, the servants are ready, the house is prepared. Where are the people? Oh, they don't want to come. Which implies that this thing cost our Lord a lot. Cost him a lot. And, 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 and that adds insult to injury. Not only did it cost me a lot, but, but you're supposed to love me and, and you won't respond to my invitation when I called you first? The people that I thought, the people that I wanted there have want nothing to do with me. I would do exactly what the Lord did. Away with them. Let me go find somebody who wants it. Because the banquet's ready. We're ready. To, the party's are getting ready to start. Somebody's going to be in here. I spent all this money already. <laughs> you got to put this practically. Imagine you spent a couple million dollars preparing <laughs> preparing for a convention and the people you thought were going to come didn't show up what would you do well, well i've already paid the i've already paid for the venue i've already paid for the party favors i've already paid for the food i've already paid for all of this somebody's got to be in here and so the call went out to go in to the highways and byways now in this particular instance there is an additional uh, action done to those who were bidden. He said, when the king heard of it, he was mad, sent forth his armies, and said, I'm going to destroy those murderers. Yes. So this tells us who Jesus is talking about now. Jews and Gentiles. Because they rejected the servants, which were the prophets who spoke to them in the Old Testament. And they killed them. And they were men of God that spoke the true word to a God to a backslidden state of Israel. So God in his anger sent forth armies to burn up those cities. And then pivoted towards the Gentiles. Which if you don't have any Jewish heritage, is you. And he said, the, verse 8, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found both bad and good. Hello, somebody. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And you would think that happy, happy, joy, joy, the parable ends right there. But there is an additional warning given to those that made it into the feast. Now, mind you, this is not the Jews, because we've already dealt with them. These are those who are found in the highways and byways, which is us. Verse number 11, keep going, sir. And when the king came in to see the guests, mm -hmm. he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Yes. And he said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Mm -hmm. Then said to the king, to servant, to the servants, bind, bind him, him hand. and hand and foot, take him away, 
Cast them into utter darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm. For many are called, but, but a few are chosen. Wow. This guy made it into the marriage feast. He's sitting at the table with everybody else. He's probably got his little, I don't know what they serve, juice, wine, whatever, water. You know how they have the cups of water. at the. You, I've been to the fancy dinners before. They got the glass cups on one side with the water and like, you know, seven forks and two spoons and two knives and all of that. And he's got his place mat and all of that. Everybody else is sitting there having a good old time. But there's a problem. Everybody else in there has on the same garment. This person just came in whatever. I guess you have to dress up if you're going to a wedding feast. We even do that today, so that, that's, that's a good rule. But this is talking about more than, just a, more than just a garment. This was so impactful that when the king came in, and the king is looking at all the guests, and can you imagine? I imagine he probably saw a sea of white, and then one guy stuck out like a sore thumb blue. I was thinking brown. Uh, you know, whatever is what it is. You know, that's why I pointed right here. I didn't want to point to anybody just to make sure that nobody could say I, I was talking about them. Nobody's in this section right here. So right, whoever is in that invisible seat right there. You. Come here. How did you get in here not having on a garment? Now, this is, the, this is the feast. Where does this take place? We learn that in Revelation. There's a marriage supper of the Lamb. Matter of fact, I think we can, if I can pull it up quick enough, we can go there. I think it's in Revelation 19. Yes, yeah, so Revelation 19, verse 9. And I saith unto me, write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell to his feet and worshiped. And he said, See, to, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. So the marriage supper of the Lamb is, is in heaven. Um, and even if you go back to verse number, um, uh, let's see, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage supper of the Lamb is coming. His wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is a righteousness of saints. When did we put on this righteousness? You, 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 you took the words out of my mouth. Baptism. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Remember Jesus said, except a man be born of the, and of the, he cannot enter. Somebody got in there only having one. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. For all, for you are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on clothed in his righteousness. And Jesus gave this parable again as an additional warning because he knew there would be people that we found out from the book of Acts when we studied the new birth that the, the, new, the water birth and the spirit of birth are separate things. They can happen very close together. You can get the Holy Ghost right after you're baptized before but they're too separate because Peter went down to Cornelius in his house, remember? And while he was at preaching to them, they received the Holy Ghost. And once they had perceived that they had received the Holy Ghost, the scripture said he's commanded them to be baptized because he understood receiving the Spirit of God alone was not enough. They needed that garment. And the Bible says he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And that's the danger. So how are we going to get up to the marriage? Well, that's very simple. When the rapture happens... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that when that trumpet blows, we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We just blink. Praise God. It's going to happen that quick. This mortal shall be made 
uh, immortal, and this corruption shall be made incorruptible. And so we're going to be caught up in the air, First Thessalonians 4 says, to be with Christ forever. That's where the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to happen. It's going to happen in heaven. And everybody who has the Holy Ghost is going to go there because the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ is going to quicken your mortal bodies, what Romans chapter 8 says. So there's going to be a lot of people that are filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when that horn blows, they're going up. But when you get up there, an inspection is going to be made. Everybody need to have on the same garment. Metaphorically speaking, it's going to be looking to see if you have applied the blood of Jesus to your life. Through the waters of baptism in Jesus' name. And the, I, the tragedy is this, this. The person was there. Thought they had made it. Not just walked, cast, hand and foot into outer, the same punishment for the unrighteous tares. I don't think God's playing about his word. How many more warnings do we need? Except a man be born of water and spirit. He said he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And the messed up part about it, it is God fills people with the Holy Ghost. We can't control that. But you control what garment you're going to put on. You control whether or not you're going to get baptized in Jesus' name. You can make that decision right now. In the same way you go to your closet and choose what you're going to put on, you can make that decision. So that man had no excuse you chose to come up here thinking you could just skate by with your own. And at that time, there's no mercy. I, even, I think if I read it correctly, the Lord even called him friend. Am I right on that? Yeah. Friend, how camest thou hither? There's no mercy in this point. Last parable. We'll be done for today. Matthew chapter 25. Any questions for about the parable? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, he said the same thing in a lot of different manners. I am the door, okay? He that cometh on another way is a thief and a robber, right? Th thief and a robber, you know, I am the good shepherd. Okay, my sheep know my voice and another they will not follow. The key thief cometh to steal, to kill, destroy, but I come that you might have. He said the same thing in many different ways. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Well, I mean, good, don't, don't, I mean, yeah, he got in there through the spirit, but it wasn't, you know. Yeah. Which is, which is a problem because... Uh, there, there's an, oh, I forget which prophet it was, but it, it testifies that our righteousness is like filthy rags. Okay? Which, which means this. Remember what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of? Why? For the remission of your sins. It wasn't blotted out. You got that old garment on. You got them old filthy rags on. It's the baptism in Jesus' name that removes your sin. No matter how good you are, you might not have another problem in this world, but you do have a sin problem, and everybody that is born has a sin problem, which means to God, you, you're, you're dressed in dirty rags. And the only way to cleanse that is through baptism in the name of Jesus. And so, so you know, that's, that's, what he's, that's, what he's, that's what he's looking at in this scenario. And without that, that you're not making it into the kingdom with that garment. And if, if you get to the point where you're in the marriage supper, it's too late. Amen. All right, Matthew 25, last one. It's about the ten virgins. This will be quick. Uh, now, context. In Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the end of the world because his disciples asked him. He talks about the destruction of the temple and his disciples asked him, well, when are these things be? And show us a sign of thy coming. And Jesus spends the rest of Matthew 24 talking about the end of the world. And so after he gets done dealing with that, he begins to tell them parables dealing with the church's responsibility while he's gone. 
We talked about one of those parables last week when we dealt with the parable of the talents. Remember that? Five, two, and one. Master went away for a long time, came back and inspected what they had, ten, four, and the one guy that had one, he was cast into outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Everybody remember that? Okay. This is the parable he told before he told the parable of the talents. Ten virgins. Let's go ahead and start in verse number one. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamp mm -hmm. and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. There, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Mm -hmm. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Mm -hmm. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be enough for us and you. But, you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Mm -hmm. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Mm -hmm. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. All right. Another parable directed to the church. It starts off with ten what? Virgins. Okay. So this, this implies that um, they were espoused to this bridegroom. They were virgins. They were ready, um, which is our state as it is right now. When Jesus instantiated the communion, you know, you've ever heard the communion. He said, uh, take this bread. He broke it and blessed it and said, this is my bread, my body, which is broken for you. Then he said of the cup, of the wine, he said, this is my blood, which is shed for the New Testament. Shed for the mission of sins of any. So, okay. And he told them to drink it. But he told them, I'm not going to drink this cup with you. I'll drink it new with you in my kingdom. Because it wasn't just a communion. It was a foreshadowing of what was a betrothal. Uh, basically, a request for marriage. And when that was done, historically speaking, the Jewish male would offer the bride a cup of wine. And if she accepted the wine, she accepted his proposal. Make sense? But he wouldn't drink it new with her until his kingdom, until they got married. So that's, that's what this is. That's, that's what that whole communion thing was talking about. It's more than just a testament. It, it, is, it is a testimony that we are engaged, metaphorically speaking, to the Lord. But we haven't gone through that marriage. Yet. Am I making sense? Okay. That's the condition these ten virgins are in. They are all engaged, but they are waiting for the bridegroom to return. And the Bible says uh, five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. And the foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, verse 4. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamp. The oil was a representation of what? Holy Ghost. It's been that way all throughout the scripture, representation of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says while the bridegroom tarried. Every example in this instance, in Matthew 25, the bridegroom takes longer than they expect. With the talents, it took longer. With this one, it took longer. And it's been 2,000 years. <laughs> it's longer than everybody expected. If you read the New Testament, they are writing these letters ex with the expectation that Jesus is coming back any time now. Paul is writing this, expecting the Lord to come back now. But here we are, almost 2,000 years removed, and yet the Lord has still not returned. But we can see all the signs pointing to that is coming. And so there's an indication that it was going to take much longer than anybody previously had expected. And so everybody fell asleep. But at midnight, darkest part of the hour, darkest part of the night, at midnight, the Bible says, a cry went out. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. You ever been woken up out of sleep abruptly and not know where you are? Don't remember what day it is. <gasps> or your smoke alarm go off in the middle of the night or something stupid like that. <sighs> Those are the words. She's, oh, like somebody knocked you out and hit you. And so they're waking up. I can imagine everybody's fumbling. We got to go. We got to get it now, putting on shoes. And, well, wait a minute. It's dark. 
It's at midnight. And this is 30 AD. There is no electricity. So when it's dark, it's dark. <laughs> You're not going to navigate unless you got light. And in this day and age, you don't have light. You don't, they don't have Duracell. <laughs> there are no LEDs in their phone. They can just pop on and they need oil if they're going to make it to this midnight hour. And the five, everybody got up and trimmed their lamps. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a metaphor for repentance, trimming your lamp. You know, because once you burn a little bit, everybody ever burned an uh, old school oil lamp? My grandma had one. And, and every now and again, you would burn it and the wick would be just burnt up and it wouldn't light on fire anymore. So in order to keep that thing burning, you had to trim off that ashes part of that wick so the oil could matriculate up into the rest of the part and the fire would kindle back up. That's, an, that's, that's a type of repentance where you cut the stuff off your life that's keeping your fire from burning. Glory to God. Cut off sin. Keep the fire from burning. Cut off the, the cares of this world that, that choke out that fruit, that seed from coming fruitful. Cut off all the, all the weight and the sin, Paul said, that so easily beset us. Well, saints, we got to cut all that stuff off. But it makes no sense to even cut it all if you have no oil. And so the five foolish are like, give me some of your oil. Why well, I'm like, mm, you lied. <laughs> Not happening. Yeah, you said it. Work out your own salvation, the scripture says, with fear and trembling. They said, we're not doing this. Go and buy for yourself. Should have took more. And the Bible says, while they were going out trying to make the last minute preparation, Lord, God help me. Sometimes I fall prey to the last minute. We got to do better. <laughs> we can't wait to the last minute because... Once it's too late, it's too late. And they went out to try to make it happen, but while they were going out, the bridegroom came. And he only took those who were ready. Are you that shaking? Lord? Mm, I don't know. And that's not a rat. On the top of this roof, I don't think there's going to be a raccoon up there. There's something up there. We'll check it out after the Bible study. Well, I've never heard that sound come up from top of the building before. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. What do you need? A possession and good. This is a good indication of, 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 of what we're doing and whether or not it makes sense. If you knew the Lord was coming tonight, what would you do from now until he came? Call out of work, pray. A lot of repenting. That's probably what we should do then. Now, nobody in here believes that God's coming tonight. It could be the Lord on top of the roof for all we know. <laughs> I, I don't think so, just based off of the evidence we have in Scripture. It's not the Lord. But you, you understand what I'm saying. You know, and, and this, is, this is one of the reasons why I think the Lord said, I'm not telling nobody exactly when I'm coming. I'll give you signs and seasons, kind of like a, a pregnant woman is going to know you know, right about right, right around what month this baby's coming. We're not going to know the day nor hour, but we know, okay, the, tra the contractions are coming. Okay, I'm getting very uncomfortable. The water's broken any day now, okay? And that's the example we're given. Paul said, as travail upon a woman with child, sudden destruction will come upon them. So we're, we're, we're looking at an instance where we don't know. So the principle in this is we have to keep ourselves in a state of readiness, Readiness and not just do bare minimums to get by. Which they, it should take this out of the question. Is that a heaven or hell issue? That's a bare minimum mindset. And if you have that mindset, I doubt you'll be prepared when the Lord will come. 
because you'd be doing bare minimums and found yourself had run out <laughs> when the Lord comes. Now, the tragedy in this is that once the door was shut, the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. They knew what had happened. They knew that they were locked out. They knew that they had missed it. But the Lord answered unto them and said, Verily, verily, I know you not. Watch, therefore, you know neither day nor hour when the Son of Man cometh. We got to be ready. Because we could miss our appointment if we're not ready. That means you could be espoused to Jesus and not be ready, not have the oil. You were supposed to be a part of that number when the saints go marching in, right? Or how I want to be in that. But we could miss it because we failed to prepare. Yes, sir. No, it's not a reach. Um, this, I'll just, I'll, we'll take you to the scripture. His question was, uh, knowing their being of intimacy, and metaphorically speaking, that that is true. Because we share different types of relationships with God. On one hand, he's our father. So we have a child-father relationship. On another hand, uh, he's our master. So we have a servant master relationship. On another hand, he's our friend. Jesus said, You're no longer my servants, but you become my friends. So he'll deal with us and she with us like friends. But on the other hand, we're also bride and bride, groom. Okay? And without, without going, we'll keep it G rated in here, you know. Uh, but everything that God designed uh, for the replication of humankind is mirrored spiritually. When, you were, when Adam knew Eve, she conceived. Make sense? Okay. What happens when someone knows? Well, a seed is planted inside and the seed grows and you give birth to something. Okay. And so that, that's what happens when you are born of the, come on. Okay. So that knowing there is being intimate in the Holy Ghost. And we can see this in Romans chapter 8. Uh, and I'm going to read it right here. Um, uh, verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit that raised him up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. I said that earlier. The spirit's going to quicken your mortal bodies. It's what's going to raise you up from the dead. Hello, somebody. Okay. Therefore, brethren, verse 12, we are not debtors. We are, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So there is an element course to being full of the Holy Ghost that's the way that God knows us make sense and so you'll see that scripture saying over and over again I know you not he, Jesus said the same thing to those in Matthew chapter 7 when he says not every man that saith unto me Lord Lord shall enter into my kingdom but only them that doeth my will let's go there I don't want to misquote it let's go there Matthew 7 22 21. Can you turn there with me, Brother Bill? This will be the last one we read today. Matthew 7, 20, 21. There we go. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. That right there blows confession out of the water. It should. You can't just confess. Not going to happen. But he that what? Do it. Hello, somebody. The will of my Father which is in heaven. Look at this, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works and then I will profess unto them I never knew you 
Depart from me, you that worketh iniquity. Again, a tragic saying. These people are not unbelievers. You got to get that in your head. Jesus' warnings are not just to the unbelievers. These are people that know the name of God and are using it to do ministry. Casting out devils, prophesying, that means speaking in his name, doing many wonderful works. We started a health clinic. We started a hospital. We started a, 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 a nonprofit. We, we, we fed the poor. We did this. We did many wonderful works. All in your name, Jesus. And his answer is, I never knew. Got to take that into consideration. Because again, except a man be born of the water. You cannot enter. Your works and deeds done in the name of Jesus is not going to grant you entrance into the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be a child of God. And the only way to become a child is to be born. <laughs> Jesus was the only immaculate conception that's happening. <laughs> Amen. That is our last parable for today. Um, next time we're going to be, we're going to deal with some of the miracles that Jesus did. We can't cover them all. John even said he couldn't cover them all. He said, if I wrote everything Jesus did, it wouldn't be enough books to contain it. So uh, we're just going to cover some of the main ones. Um, and for a homework question is, <sighs> mm. these are pretty. <laughs> well, Sister Antasia normally puts it on, but she says she couldn't come because it was rain and she couldn't get out of her apartment. So. Somebody, if somebody could put this question on a telegram group, that would be good. I got to think of one first. Uh, it wasn't because we, we were, we, this is a continuation of last week's study. Because I, I was long-winded last week and we took forever. It was my fault. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm guilty more than you. Just ask my wife. She, I talk a lot. Uh, let me see. I heard that. Hmm. Mm. Where was Lazarus raised from the dead from? Don't say it. Where was Lazarus? Where was that at? No, this, no, no. The city. The city. What? What? Where? What, what city was Lazarus raised from the dead? What city was it? You Bible scholars, you. Huh? No, Brother John, because all the rest of them are just miracles that everybody's heard. How do you ask a question about, okay, what was the name of the blind man that Jesus said? Well, which one? Ones that are unnamed that he healed. We don't even know their names. You know, so we have to, I have to ask you something that you can, that I know you can find in the scripture. It's not what is it called? Uh, uh, ambiguous. That's the term I'm looking for. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I won't. I will, I will come prepared. You have my word. <laughs> hey, man, do we have any other questions tonight before we close? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Two piece. Mm. This is to the church. Jew or Gentile. Yes, ma'am.
Correct. Because I'm not ready. Because yeah. Ready. Yes, ma'am. What, what, what would cause someone to... I mean, there's a myriad of reasons, but um, this is going to sound real stupid. I'm kind of stupid sometimes, so I got to kind of keep it plain. I know what time I need to be up tomorrow for prayer. At five in the morning. And my alarm's going to go off at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and there's been times where I knew, I even knew what time I needed to be here. I knew how long it was going to take me to get here. I, I, I knew how long it was going to take me to get dressed. And I was late anyway. Why would you be late then? Laziness, procrastination, flesh, yeah, you know, all, 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 there's a lot of things that go into the answer to that question is, 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 my, is, is, is my point. Yeah. Yeah. And so. That's, that's the warning, and, and, and we have to keep ourselves in a place of discipline, really, is what that is. It's the, it's, it's the day-to-day discipline. All in, yeah, just all locked in the room till the Lord comes. Uh, well, yeah, but, you know, Cain killed Abel, so I don't even think that would work. Somebody's dying. <laughs> you lock everybody in the room. Somebody's going to die quickly. I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, that's, that's a complicated question. And I, I think what you're really, I think for, for you particularly, you understand the gravity of it. And that's, that's kind of what it is. You know, I, I had a, and this is a long-winded, I, I, I'll keep it short. In, during my college years, I, work, I worked in restaurants. And I worked with this one chef. He was a great guy. Um, and I, I lived five minutes walking distance from where I worked. And it was, a, it was a nice restaurant. We opened in the evenings. It was only open in the evenings from 3 to 11. And I had to be there at 2. And I only lived five minutes walking distance. Yet there would be times where I was 15 minutes late while I was five minutes walking distance. And in one time, now I'm living on my own. One time this, this, this chef who I, who I respected very highly, he said, Brandon, you're one of the best cooks I got. He said, but if you're late again, I'm going to have to fire you. I'm like 22 at the time. He's like, so you, it's time for you to man up. And that hit because I had bills to pay. I got a car payment to pay. I got insurance. I have a cell phone. So when the gravity of my decisions hit home for me, my actions and behavior changed, I was never late for that job again. So, you know, once we understand the gravity of that decision to hit the snooze button, You know, I, I think it's got to begin to mean something more to us. And the issue is none of us really know when that day is coming. And too many times we have pulled things together at the last minute. And so we think we can treat this particular thing like that. But the, but the, the, the warning at the end of that parable, the Lord said, watch. Because you don't really know what hour. Earlier on, another version, he says, and, that, and when you think he's coming, he's coming at another hour. So even when we got our mind made up, oh, it's today. <laughs> you know, so we got to understand the gravity of it and, 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 and begin to get a revelation that this really means more than anything else we're doing in this world. Nothing else we're doing. Like I said, if we knew the Lord was coming tonight, what would you do? From now until he came. I guarantee you it would be different than what you had planned. Some of us, some of us, we block in the church. I'm not going nowhere. I'm staying right here. Amen. Amen. And so, you know, that means that means by our own admission, we can be held guilty if the Lord comes right now. We haven't done it. That's tough. That pricked me right there because I plan on going home and going to sleep. 
<laughs> I wake up early to pray. Praise God. I'm a, I need to make sure I'm saved as well. Got to get, got to get, get right in line. In Jesus' name. Yes, sir. And we're done. Mm-hmm. You know, what we yeah. <laughs> you drove by SpaceX, like, Lord, take us. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, because it's a rocket. It probably looked like what a nuke would look. Well, nukes are much smaller than rockets, but I, I got you. Uh, uh, newsflash, we're very close to that right now. Ukraine is getting very bold and doing some things behind Russian lines, and Putin is not happy with it. And uh, Israel, is, Israel just batted out of the sky, I think, 300-something mod missiles, 200-something missiles today from Hezbollah. So things, it's still trouble going on. So, uh, and these are some of the signs that Jesus talked about uh, that would be the sign of his coming. So, uh, which is of what I believe God is trying to get us. He's trying to wake us up. Remember, that cry came out before the bridegroom came, which is another indication. You're going to have warning. Is it not a lot? <laughs> it's not a long time. It's a small warning. Yes, sir. Not, oh, yeah, they have the, the, uh, the doomsday clock. Yeah. Closer than we've ever been. Yeah, that's man's clock. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. I don't know. Amen. Let's make sure we got right. Okay, reiterate the homework. What city was Lazarus in when he was raised from the dead? What city was Lazarus in? Amen. All right, let's close out tonight in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your word here tonight. We thank you for every hard word that you gave us, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that we won't just be hearers of it, Lord God, but you would help us to be doers of your word, to apply it to our lives, Lord God. But we want to hear, well done, now good and faithful servant, Lord God. We don't want to hear, depart from me, Lord God. We don't want to hear that you didn't know us, Lord God. We want you to know us, Lord God, and to be known of you, Lord Jesus, oh God, that your will can be accomplished in and through our lives. I pray that you help us to accomplish it, Lord God. Draw us as only you can, Lord. Help us to walk in ways of righteousness, Lord God. Away from the sin and darkness of this world, Lord God. But in ways that pleases you, Lord Jesus. We don't want to be tares, Lord. We want to be the wheat, Lord God. We want to bring forth good fruit that you are pleased with, Lord God. And I pray, Lord, as you tarry, Lord, help us to perform your work, Lord God. To be steadfast and unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, oh God. We love you tonight, Lord. As we leave this place, Lord, I pray that you give a traveling mercies to make it home safely. We give you the glory. We give you the honor and we give you the praise in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.